Welcome to Bloomberg Law. I'm Lee Pacquia. As the debate over whether college athletes should be paid continues, a different angle to the story has emerged. The NCAA exploits its vault of photos, videos, and film, and athletes like basketball great Oscar Robertson, who hasn't played for the University of Cincinnati in over 50 years, still do not share in the revenue that the NCAA generates. Ed O'Bannon, who was the College Basketball Player of the Year in 1995 at UCLA, has filed a lawsuit over this very same issue. Author Taylor Branch recently wrote in The Atlantic that a victory by the plaintiffs in O'Bannon's case would radically transform college sports. Colleges would likely have to either stop profiting from students or start paying them. I'm joined now from Washington, D.C. by attorney Michael Hausfeld. He represents Ed O'Bannon. Welcome, sir. Thanks for your time today. Thank you very much, Lee. Please walk me through this. How does the uh, NCAA exploit its vault? What are they selling? They're basically selling um, the rights to license um, the performances in older games um, to vi for video content, for digital content, for video games, uh, and essentially um, accruing revenue in the billions of dollars a, a year. How, how does this process work? Are they sold up front ahead of time? Is this operating under uh, an agreement that was set up long ago, or is this something that, that happens over the course of time? What's the business process look like? Um, it's something that occurs over the course of time as contracts um, become renewed or as companies become interested in the license rights um, to the uh, footage in the vault. So tell me a little bit about the Ed O'Bannon case. Uh, it looks pretty interesting. How did it come to you? Um, there were a number of um, sports personages who were getting increasingly uh, upset by the exploitation of um, athletes' images, names, and likenesses by the NCA, um, its member institutions and conferences through, uh, for example, the sales of uh, footage and license rights to video game uh, manufacturers, uh, to digital manufacturers, and generally um, for uh, broadcasts like um, ESPN Classics. Mm -hmm. So as it stands now, what rights do NCAA athletes have to their own images? Do they have any? None, no. Why is that? In fact, uh, because the NCAA has said that not only does the athlete, but the athlete's heirs have no rights to those names or images. Uh, the words that uh, are used by the NCAA are in perpetuity and throughout the universe. Mm -hmm. And this, this all comes to be in the student-athlete statement that athletes have to sign when they go into the NCAA to play uh, sports? Yes. Um, it's either explicit or implicit. If they don't agree to that or the NCAA does not assert that, then in essence the athlete loses um, his eligibility to participate um, in the programs. Right. It's an interesting concept. If you could tell us a little bit more about the, the student-athlete statement and what's in there. Um, Outside of, of the NCAA's definition, is there a legal definition for a student athlete? What does this term exactly mean in our society? No, there is none. It's a self-serving um, principle that was created um, by the NCAA essentially to distinguish um, the student athlete from an employee so that the um, universities wouldn't be held liable um, in insurance uh, and for disabilities resulting from injuries occurred during the athlete's performance. Um, it became uh, essentially a camouflage for the NCAA, its conferences and, and institutions, being able to sell the student athlete's rights um, to their names and images and receive that remuneration themselves and exclude the athletes from any allocation of a, a fair market value uh, to them. So what legal theory uh, are you going to pursue on behalf of your client? Um, as the Supreme Court recently held in the American Needle case, um, combinations of um, athletic organizations like member institutions belonging to a, a, a conference or uh, an association constitute uh, a cartel. If a cartel imposes a restraint that is unreasonable, it is accountable under the uh, antitrust laws to those persons that are excluded from the market and or whose um, labor or, or labor um, value is fixed by the cartel in the market. And what is the status of the case now? Where are we? 
Um, the d various defendants have moved three times to dismiss the complaint. Three times the judge has denied the motions and we're in full discovery and scheduled for trial sometime uh, next year. Well, I, I guess I should back up a bit. Who are, who are the multiple defendants? I know the NCAA is involved here, but who else is being, uh, being pursued? Uh, then there is the NCA's licensing, principal licensing agent, the CLC, um, and uh, one of the video game manufacturers, EA. I see. Uh, any guesses as to how this is going to play out? This is uh, a pretty interesting situation we have here. Um, it's playing out in a number of different forms. Uh, the um, NCAA president just, I think, today or yesterday, um, advocated increasing the grant and aids uh, to athletes in order to provide them partial compensation right. for the revenue they're producing. Uh, you've got a number of schools um, complaining about the imbalance right now uh, in uh, the NCA by reason of the realignment of conferences and the fact that some conferences uh, can uh, garner a higher TV broadcast license than other conferences. So it's right. all, it, it goes to the fundamentals of w what relationship is there really between the school and the athlete, what are the rights of the athlete, and how that relationship can be re changed to reflect um, modern day commercialization by the association and the schools of um, those athletic performances. Right, I thought it was particularly interesting that recent proposal that came out to give a, a small stipend to uh, student athletes. I think it was to the tune of $2,000, that's per year. Um, that number seems rather low to me given the amount of revenue that these athletes bring to their institutions. Do you expect that to be a moving target, maybe that number to increase over time? Not only do I expect it to be a moving target, I expect you to see um, a difference of opinion with, within um, the schools that comprise the conferences. Those schools um, that are not in the greater revenue producing conferences um, are already stating that they don't have the money to provide that extra $2,000, so they will right. be further disadvantaged competitively. A and so you have the whole issue of the revenue that's general, gen <clears throat> generated mm -hmm. by the commercialization by the NCA of um, those broadcasts and, and those um, publicity rights, essentially itself creating an imbalance uh, and discrimination within um, the association's members. Michael, what would be the best result to this case in a perfect world? That the NCA sit down with its institutions and seriously consider a rational realignment of some of its rules uh, in order to create a stronger organization to police violations of the rules, to avoid um, activity which would truly undermine the game, to set standards for the game, but to allow um, the uh, athletes to participate fully um, in their rightful share of the revenue that they generate by reason of their performances. Michael Hausfeld from the law firm Hausfeld LLP in Washington, D.C. I want to thank you so much for your time today, sir. You're most welcome, Lee. Take care. If you'd like to learn more about the cases and issues we just discussed, go check out our offerings on BloombergLaw.com. We have the law, Labor and Employment Law Report and also the Antitrust Law Report. Again, they're both available on BloombergLaw.com. I'm Lee Pacquia. Thanks for watching.